Dr. Scott Robinson is the Ordway Professor at the Florida Museum of Natural History. And Scott also taught at the uh, University of Illinois after getting his bachelor's degree at Dartmouth and his doctorate at Princeton. And Scott teaches avian biology at UF and has been a fanatical bird watcher since his father introduced him to the hobby in 1967. Um, he took a gap year in college to set a new North American big year record in 1976. And his lab at uh, the Florida Museum of Natural History, uh, or uh, his lab mostly studies birds in South America, but also has projects in Africa and China. Um, so, uh, and back in the late 1970s and 80s, before there were any field guides or other easily available sources of information, um, ornithologists made pioneering visits to remote sites in the Amazon and Andes, where they obtained the first recordings of bird songs, described many new species, and characterized the structures of those um, really hyper diverse tropical bird communities. Um, but I'll let uh, uh, hand it off to uh, Dr. Scott Robinson and let him talk about um, his big day, um, you know, where he established a world record. Um, and um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, you know, put them in the chat box uh, and, and then we, uh, we can pass those on um, uh, or, and, or then we'll uh, have those answered at the end. So without further ado, thank you, Dr. Scott Robinson. Hello, Tim, I, I'm, I'm Scott, please. Um, yeah, so th thank you very much for that very, very good introduction. That's, um, that, that covers, it, covers it well. Uh, this is going to be a, a talk about a big day, but the big day we did back then, as Tim said, the context of this is is very important because the uh, what what we did back then was something that was that was sort of unprecedented. In fact, we, it got almost no fanfare at all when it happened. The, people thought it was mildly curious, but that was about it. Um, but but the context for this, I think, is almost everything. But I am going to just talk a little bit about. Let's see if I can get my slide moving. I've only done this five hundred times while lecturing. There we go. All right. Well, I, I do want just a, an extremely brief personal history. I was taught birds by my father, uh, as Tim mentioned, William Robinson, Bill Robinson, who was a conservationist back in the 50s and 60s, very heavily influenced by Rachel Carson, who was a fellow Pittsburgher um, and uh, who taught at, taught at Chatham College. And uh, he was also a interested in ornithological science. He, I have subscription. He, he subscribed to the AUK which is now called Ornithology, a scientific journal. But he was also a fanatically competitive birder. He just loved to go after, to try break records, the most warblers seen in the day and build big days lists. So I had this kind of weird conservation science, bird watching as a competitive fun game sort of sport drilled into me in, in my youth. And my whole career has been sort of balancing these, these, um, uh, these different aspects of my career with varying degrees of success. Now I've always been, perhaps because of the way I was raised, I was I've always been drawn irresistibly drawn to extremely diverse, hyper diverse, biodiverse sites. Can you see my my uh, my pointer? Great. Um, the richest bird communities in the world, of course, are in South America. There's some places in Asia that aren't too far off, but really these hotter colors in in South America are proportional to the number of species that occur over points, and by far the richest areas are in Eastern Colombia and Ecuador and Southeastern Peru. And, what, and of course we didn't have these maps back then, but we had a pretty good inkling that there were a lot of birds down here. Um, and I actually, with this in mind, I actually chose my graduate advisor, John Turborg, who I'll talk about quite a bit during this presentation, who now lives in Cedar Key, I might add, um, because he had a field station located right in the heart of this, of this hyper diverse region. And the, 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 it was hard to imagine how these, this region could be so diverse, because if you look at aerial photos of this area, it is just a flat carpet of forest. It doesn't seem to vary all that much, except immediately along rivers. I mean, how can you possibly have 600 species of birds in just flat lowland forest? And no one had any idea back in the 70s and 80s. There was this general idea the tropics had lots of habitats, but, you know, but, but we didn't really know much about that. And so the, you know, just the lure of trying to figure out how you could pack so many species into this little area was you know, you brought me to all the way down to Peru. Um, and back in those days, and to, to some extent, this is still true, getting there was, was an adventure. I mean, I, I, I know it sounds like a cliche to call it an adventure, but it really was almost unbelievable. We had to, you flew into Cusco in the highlands of Peru, bought all your supplies to last three or four months, which was quite tricky. Uh, in the in the lowland Amazon where everything rots. This is John Turborg here in a car 
the actual Kocha Cashew truck, which unfortunately crashed not too long after this particular thing. But we would load all our stuff into these trucks and drive for two days until we reached the Manu Road. You can barely see it going down into this valley. The Manu Road is now one of the world's top 10 birding destinations. There's, there's more than 1,000 species that live regularly along this transect from the high Andes all the way down to the Amazon basin in, in the view in the background. Um, and at the time we did this, the Manu Road really was just, just a road that uh, was one way on, on each day. You could go down on one day and then the next day you had to come back up. It was a very rough road. Um, and you know, a lot of my students, we've, we've done a lot of work on the road since my thesis, but back then you start out going along the, these trucks, uh, everyone kind of piled on top of, of, their, of their gear, um, last quite a long time. And every once in a while we would catch glimpses of these glorious birds. This is the Andean cock of the rock. There was a lek right on the road and every once in a while we'd see one of these birds flash out in there, but we really couldn't stop. You didn't have time to stop. You had to get down the mountain as soon as you could. And so, you know, and now there's a lodge built around this particular lek called the Cock of the Rock Lodge. The only times you could ever do any bird watching was when the, was when the roads washed away, um, would you have to stop and rebuild it. Uh, there, so the bridges were pretty interesting. We got, we finally got down into the lowlands. Again, the roads were in terrible shape, but eventually you would make it to the Alto Madre de Dios River, which is the river where you would start to load your, your gear into boats, you these dugout canoes with reinforced sides with these long motor, uh, uh, indoor outboard motors called the uh, Pecky Peckies, you know, 16 horsepower Briggs and Stratton. And you just, then you would just eventually just load your stuff into these boats and work your way up these meandering rivers. And this two to three day boat trip, depending on water levels and how good your motor was, was, was a highlight of almost anyone's life. It was perhaps a little dull, a little, little warm, but as long as you're out in the river moving, it was fun. And you could, you could see the transition as you would get deeper and deeper into this area of endemism. You, you, you would start to see macaws, birds that are generally hunted out of areas. This is the blue and yellow macaw. On the beach, you could start seeing the Orinoco goose. This is the last breeding population of this bird in all of Peru uh, on the Manu River. The muscovy duck, which we think of as a pest, as a pestiferous uh, feral bird in, 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 our, in our various ponds, you actually see wild ones out there. And they're, they're a really impressive bird in the wild. Every once in a while you'd see a sun bittern, which are those classic birds people always go to the tropics to see. And then horned screamers, these, these extremely ancient lineage of, of waterfowl. They're sort of vaguely like a goose or even a magpie goose, for those of you who know international birds. These big birds can only survive in areas where you get pretty far away from really intensive uh, hunting. Then you start getting the really top predators. This has got to be the place in the world where, where you get the largest number of photographs of jaguars. This is jaguars uh, after when cold fronts come through, they come out and sun themselves on the beaches and tourists routinely see jaguars on this. This is a place where you can occasionally see a harpy eagle, although I've only seen this bird a few times in my life. Um, there are giant otters, which were formerly highly endangered, but have recovered quite nicely now that they're no longer being harvested for the pelts. And then you start seeing larger birds, such as the blue-throated piping guan, a bird, that, the kind of bird that are generally tended to be hunted to extinction. And then you the, then occasionally you see these very large caimans, a black caiman, which also went back in the early 80s was very, very rare. There were just a few thousand big ones left in the remotest reaches of the Amazon. Um, just, just as our alligators were once fairly rare. Now they're now really quite common. These things get to be 17 or 18 feet long and, and are probably responsible for the death of at least one scientist, although that still remains somewhat of a mystery. You get, then, you, then you get into the truly Amazonian bird. This is the archetypal Amazonian bird, the Hawatsan, an ancient lineage of plant-eating bird that has many, many different elements of the natural history. But these, the, the lure of getting into these places was very great. And above all, what John Turborg was interested in was going to places where you were as far from the influence of modern humans as possible, where you could get something approaching what we call a pristine environment, where, um, where you still have trumpeters. This is a, the trumpeters are, again, one of these uh, ancient families of, of birds that are in the, in the Gruid, the rail grouping. They are terrestrial frugivores. They depend largely on monkeys to knock fruit onto the ground, and then they eat the fruit quickly before it rots because fruit, fruit doesn't last long 
on the tropical floor. So you need monkeys, you need low hunting, and these, and these birds become, again, they're fairly common. There are the famous mineral lakes. You've probably everyone who's interested in birds have seen these photos. These were the original photos of the, of the mineral lakes. These, these pictures are all my, uh, they well, they're supposed to be, but, you know, they, but these are uh, red and green macaws eating clay to help them digest seeds. There are also tribes that the, you know, the native tribes that live along these rivers. The Machigengas here in a dugout canoe trade along the river that have a, have a lot of contact with uh, with uh, you know the, the Peruvian government, but 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 still live in a, pretty much the way they've been living for a long time. Then there are the Nawa Indians, a, a tribe that uh, occasionally contacts civilization. This particular group apparently contacted a bunch of oil petroleum explorers. We don't know how they got this gear, but they're. They're a tribe that is still largely uncontacted. This particular group splintered off when apparently all of the, nearly all of the adults died of, a, of a, one of the diseases that we brought in and they, they came out. And then there's the, the apparently semi-nomadic Mashko Piros. They're uncontacted in the sense that, that, they, that they are still living uh, a, a, a life without contact with, with a modern civilization, well, with, not modern, but with, with Peruvian civilization. Or, yeah, modern civilization, but they, this is by choice. They, you know, they're 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 staying out of contact because they don't want to contact us. They want to live their, the lives the way they've lived them all along. These are three women who uh, decided to leave that life and and they joined the society in the Amazon basin. Eventually, after you're cruising up this river, seeing these various things, flying over the boat and look and hoping to see a jaguar, you eventually arrive at Cochicasha which is an oxbow lake, a very old oxbow lake of the Manu River. There's a biological station located right here, right at the tip of that point. And then you, you unload your stuff, carry it into the station, and then you, you reach a place I really consider paradise. This is where this, all of this big day took place. The entire big day took place in this area right, right in here, uh, just, which is about uh, one square mile. And now you notice this is a site where these side scanning radar images that show a lot of different habitats. I might want to point out that a large, you know, we did this whole thing in the floodplain of the Manu River, but the terra firma forest, which has a lot of bamboo in it, at the time we did this work was not accessible. We didn't have a trail system. So the record, if we had had that trail system, we probably could have added at least 30 or four species to the record. This is the, this was the Cochicashu Biological Station back when I started work in the late 70s and early 80s. It was just a couple of thatched hut buildings, a lake where we would swim and bathe, dug out canoes that we would use to paddle around the lake. And most people who were working there were studying primates because this is one of the very best places in the world to study primate populations where they haven't yet been driven to near extinction by, by human hunting. This was one of the earliest groups of scientists who, who worked in this area. You can't actually see John Turborg here, but uh, Charlie Jansen and Wilson, uh, well, either, you know, there's me with a, with a wonderful tan, which I'll explain later. Charlie Mott, I'll, I'll describe some of these people later. There are also a great many Peruvian students. This biological station continues to be used almost entirely now by, by Peruvian scientists and students and classes. And also a, a bunch of really, really quite well-known scientists. John Turborg, who again, I met, is living in Cedar Key right now. He actually started, he got the station started as a permanent biological station. For those of you who know plants, Robin Foster is, is probably the greatest living tropical botanist. Pat Wright here did her PhD thesis here. Pat Wright is the person who's done probably more to, to conserve forests in Madagascar than any other human. And this is John Fitzpatrick during his dissertation days. We all look fairly uh, grungy towards the end of the field season there and, uh, for, with good reason. Jo John Fitzpatrick did a lot of the pioneering work and these two people learned a tremendous amount about bird song. Again, there were no field guides. There was the Birds of South America was a gigantic field guide that was almost useless as a field guide. And uh, there were no, nothing else. So they, you know, they, 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 they went to museums, they recorded birds, they lured them in, and they contributed a phenomenal amount of basic information. I mean, but, I mean and, you know, which was done even more extensively at the LSU Museum of Natural Sciences, where they were really, there were teams of people went out and explored big chunks of, of South America, recorded lots of birds, collected this, you know, at least 60 or 70 new species of birds have been described in Peru by various, you know, I think John Turborg has described seven or eight species, Fitz, you know, Fitz has probably described at least that number as well. Um, and 
And of course, he's, he's, he was until recently the director, uh, the person who built the Cornell Lab of Ornithology from 14 employees to over 300. Now, there, there is, this is a very seasonal environment. During the dry season, this place is paradise. During the wet season, after heavy rains, this place is really brutal. It is just, you know, it's very hard to keep your feet from rotting, your clothes from rotting. Uh, it, you, you, you rarely see the sun, and it's just a whole different matter. Uh, Charlie Munn here, who is now very famous for promoting uh, ecotourism in South America, to start the field season, he looked like a, a typical Princetonian, if I might say. By the end of the field season, he started looking, looking, looking pretty, pretty grungy. We all looked about the same way. Now, this was the bird. I, I should say, I actually did my PhD thesis on just one bird, an extremely common bird, a very abundant colonial back, black bird called the yellow rump cassie, which I still think is the most interesting bird I have ever studied. They were a very common colonial bird, uh, absolutely gorgeous bird, you know, fairly easy to catch, very easy to observe at these colonies. And I took the lowest hanging fruit I could take. Um, they, they, they nested on, on little teeny little one tree islands and trees scattered on the edge of Cochicashu, which is this oxbow lake. The biological station was right here. Um, I would just paddle my boat around this lake and watch the birds and, and watch the almost daily or sometimes several times a day battles between toucans, such as this uh, Cuvier's toucan, and, uh, and the caciques. These things, toucans attack colonies. They, they probably spend most of their day searching for bird nests and only a very small percentage of the day actually eating fruit, the way we've all been conditioned to believe they do. Uh, here I am reenacting one of the more strenuous moments of my dissertation in the dugout canoe. But, you, but even that became easier. Towards the end, I actually had a very comfy kayak. It was kind of like a floating a recliner where I could simply lift my binoculars occasionally, watch birds behave. Sometimes I have to stand up and pull birds out of mist nets we strung out over the water. But I really had a kind of a nice, pleasant time. But during the, but during the time that I was watching these birds, mostly over the lake, John Turborg and I hatched this plot to do to redo to do the first large scale census of a tropical bird community. The only censuses ever been conducted of tropical bird communities were on areas of about five acres, two hectares, which really you know, we, we didn't think was really going to uh, give you a very accurate picture of what was going on in the tropical bird community. So John and I decided to uh, to do this census, and John actually wrote the grant proposal, got funding to, to do a, an actual comprehensive whole community census. But we knew that there were people out there who were really better even than we were. This is Ted Park, who died tragically about, tw about 25 years ago now. Actually, I think it's coming up on his 30th anniversary now of his death. Um, and he, he was probably, or maybe I'm probably, he was the greatest bird watcher of, uh, of his era. He traveled all over South America, recorded birds, described the first vocalizations of countless species, participated in many, many expeditions, and really and had an amazing said, you know, he was great at seeing birds, but his ears, he could remember anything he heard. And above all, if he heard, you could play him any song of any bird in the world, and he could recognize, he could identify without context. He, he didn't need to know, okay, this is from Amazonian Peru. You're in mature forest. He would just know what it was. He could pick things out. And so we, so John and I decided that we needed to have these extremely knowledgeable people helping out with this bird census. We, we knew most of the bird songs, probably 98% of them, but that last 2% was something we, we didn't know. And of course, Ted came in and, and, uh, and helped us with this census, was a co-author on the paper. He did it voluntarily. Um, because he was really excited about doing this project. And this gave me a chance to really just learn a ton. I mean, I just learned so much from hanging out with Ted. I learned a lot from John and, and Fitz as well. But, but you know, the, the month that Ted spent down there at Cochicasha was one of the most interesting and valuable months of my life. Uh, Ted, Ted was, again, he was well-connected. This is Roger Torrey Peterson, for those of you who don't know. I, I, I also met Roger Torrey Peterson once before, before he passed. Uh, but Ted was a legend even in those days. And again, here's Ted at work carrying a Nagra tape recorder, 20 plus pound recorder that he carried with him and somehow kept intact for decades of work. Um, and again, recording these birds using this absolutely fantastic, all of his recordings are classics. 
we we for years we've been doing lots of mist netting. This is mist netting along a river river edge where you get lots of interesting second growth birds. This is John. Uh, but this was the actual plot that we did. And we mapped, we did spot mapping of color, we did color band of bird studies, mist netting, song censuses. We we did everything we possibly could to document the biodiversity of birds on this 100 hectare, 250 acre plot. And there are some points on this plot where there were as many as 165 species that coexisted over a single point, which is a mind bending total. I mean, in a, in a Florida forest, maybe you get 15 or 20 over a point. But this is, again, this is essentially an order of magnitude greater than anything we'd ever document. And it was also, we also found that big birds, such as this razor billed curacao, were really quite common. They were just as common as a lot of little 10 gram ant wrens and warblers and vireos. Tinamous were extremely abundant where they're not hunted. Uh, toucans, so you know, araceri, such as the curl crested and the lettered araceri, were abundant. Ant followers, raptors were quite. This, rap, this bird here, the lion forest falcon, had territories of only 100 acres, uh, which, which is probably about what the red children hawk has. So we, we, we learned a lot of amazing things, but the, one of the main things we learned was that there were an awful lot of birds that coexisted over the same point. And how this could happen, we don't know. It wasn't that there were lots of habitats down there, although that does play a major role too. But you can pack, you just can keep packing birds into these communities, which is really, I think, very interesting, at least from my point of view. And one of the major results that we found was that if you look at the number of territories or home ranges per 100 hectares, and you plot from the most abundant down to the least abundant, this is complicated. So this is you know the 210 species we we did territory maps or home range maps uh, for that plot. Look how the vast majority of these birds have ter have fewer than five pairs of breeding units per 250 acres. That's 50 acres per pair. So this, so what really is going on in these forests is that they are, you're packing in a lot of birds that are very rare. And this was, this of course opened the door wide open for a big day because we had lots of birds in a very small area, but on the other hand, the challenge was they were very rare. And that was, that was ultimately the kind of where the tactics of trying to do a big day was. And we have, we have since learned that one of the main reasons why there's so many birds that get packed in there is that predation is just overwhelming in this place. It is full of primates, brown capuchin monkeys, white fronted, white faced capuchin monkeys. I think the names have changed in the late taxonomic revision. They're very common, very, very aggressive nest predators. Huge herds, up to 200 strong white lipped peccaries. Uh, you know, they boom and bust with various disease cycles. But when they're common, they depredate all the birds that try to nest on the ground, such as this, um, such as Bartlett's tinamou. Many, many snakes. This is a rainbow boa that is an occasional nest predator. And I already mentioned toucan. So you have all of these predators. It's very, very hard to have a successful nest. And these birds are all appeared to be, their populations are knocked very low by, by the abundance of these predators and by the fact that probably at best, 80, at best, 10 to 20 percent of the nests that are built ever fledge young. Uh, we also, but we also figured out that these diverse habitats along river floodplains were very, very important. When you map the territories, we often found that there was one species that lived in the young vegetation along the rivers, and another that lived in the mature forest. So once again, there, you know, there, there were lots of birds in this early successional habitat. Uh, but they're and they're different from those in the mature forest. So from a tactical big day point of view, well, we had to cover that too. And again, when we just look at the area, we you know, the, the, when, when Ted and I started strategizing a big day, John Turborg was there, but he was unable to do it for scientific reasons. I think we, Ted and I took a day off from science, but we, um, we 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 decided we could probably do the whole thing just in this one area here. We knew there was good good stuff up here, but without a trail system, there really wasn't much we could do. Um, and again, I, in the for the future, this is going to be a very, you know, very important thing we're going to do. So when we finally decided, so Ted and I finally decided that the record was within reach at, at this place. Just, I mean, this again, I, it sounds like we did this NSF grant to census this plot just to lead to a big day. But that wasn't entirely true. But we knew, for, as a result of this census, we knew a lot. You know, we really had the place was wired for a big day. 
And the night, the night birds in this part of the world are pretty easy. They call constantly. There are a few that are difficult. When we did the census, we did, we, you know, Ted actually, this bird down here at the bottom is called the silky tailed night jar. And Ted had never heard it. I'd never heard it, but we heard a mysterious night jar. He recorded it and sure enough, it turned out to be the silky tailed night jar, which is a, it turns out to be moderately common. But there were oscillated poor wills, typical night jars. This is the great potu, a bird that, that sounds sort of like it's vomiting theatrically when it calls. Uh, there are a few forest falcons that call at least uh, you know, towards morning, crested owls. We, we could get practically the whole nocturnal bird community with just a few. We didn't even start until 3.30, and we had almost all the nocturnal birds by, um, by, you know, by dawn. Uh, I'm sure going, if we went back and did it again, we could add quite a few more. Because, but there are a lot of birds who, who the long-tailed potu, for example, we didn't even know what their... Um, uh, what their uh, you know, what their call was. Um, so when we get, when we got into the dawn chorus, then this was where the greatest challenge was because when these birds are occur at very low population densities, they don't have to sing much. You know, they sing a few times and you know, establish oh, nope, there's no one else here, and then they're quiet the rest of the day. This bird here, the strided ant thrush in the upper left, I'm pretty sure they sing once a day, at least the one on our plot. The, the wood, wood creepers, such as the long build and strong build wood creepers, they sing a little bit more often, but again, they have most of their singing occurs just at the very earliest light. Tinamous, such as the variegated tinamous, there are nine or ten tinamous down there. And again, they mostly sing very early in the morning, not entirely, but the best time to catch them. And the lying forest falcon, the forest falcons, mot mots, they also have dawn courses, many other species. So while what you literally we practically had to jog around the plot during those very very early morning hours to try to cover as much as we can and, and increase the odds of hearing these these birds that you know, barely sing at all and that was what where we probably had the best luck we really really nailed the early morning when we we, we got a huge percentage of these of these dawn chorus birds now a lot of these birds also sing at dusk and we were able to uh, we had another shot at them later but um but then after the after the running around the early the, the dawn, we then had to get to the river edge at least briefly before it got too incredibly hot, because the river edge habitats, as I mentioned earlier, they have really different birds. There, you know, the the uh, red billed scythe bill, for example, is a very flexible bird. They like bamboo, but they also like river edge cane thickets. Um, there are austral migrants such as the yellow brow tyrant that, that that were still there. They hadn't they hadn't yet um, left for their breeding grounds. There were incredibly large numbers of obscure flycatchers, such as the southern bearded tyrannulate and the inornate tyrannulate. There were a few North American migrants starting to show up, such as the eastern kingbird. And then there were really a high diversity of shorebirds along the river at low water, including some really cool ones, like the buff-breasted sandpiper, the baird sandpiper, upland sandpiper, white rump sandpiper, stilt sandpiper. It's almost uncanny how the really rare interesting North American birds all seem to spend the end of the dry season in, in this part portion of Amazonia before they before the rains come and they have to clear out. On the, you know, but, they, but they often spend several months there that the water levels stay low. So these shorebirds give us a pretty good chance to get a lot of northern migrants and, and the beaches give us, you know, the early successional vegetation give us a pretty good opportunity to get both austral migrants, southern migrants, and Nearctic migrants. So this was a big deal. We had a pretty good shorebird count that day. We had Wilson's fowler up too. I also should point out that parrots, fortunately, are very noisy, but there are lots of parrots. So there are probably 15, 20 species of parrots, including the painted parakeet, the uh, orange cheeked parakeet. I really, I'm sorry, I, that doesn't sound right. Um, the, I, I have a weird mix of English and Latin names on that line. And then there's the Manu parrotlet, a bird that had only been described discovered a few years earlier at a mineral lake in the Manu National Park. Turns out to be fairly widespread, but Charlie Munn first discovered this and then another group went out and confirmed it. So these parrots, you got you, you, you can, most of them you can identify by voice, but it's good to be out in the open where you can see them as well. Then, then before it got too, once again, before the day got too advanced, we, we, we then went out onto the, uh, that Oxbow Lake, Cochicasho, where we paddled around the lake and this is, again, these are birds you, I see, I would see every day. There's the agami heron, easily one of the world's most beautiful herons, extremely long-billed thing. The sun bittern, 
which we already talked a little bit about. They, they're mainly a lake, lake margin bird more than a river margin bird. Greater Anis, it was touch and go whether they will, they're an intra-tropical migrant. They move around the tropics. Uh, they appear during the wet season. They have a fascinating cooperative breeding bird. They also really smell bad, which makes me wonder if this garish plumage isn't, isn't a warning to predators. Um, they, uh, there are rufous and tiger herons. This is a juvenile boat billed herons. Uh, this little bird here, the rufous sided crake, which is probably has territories about the size of my office. They're so abundant. The lake margin birds are great. They're generally pretty easy to see though. So you don't have, to, we, we didn't have to do this incredibly early in the morning, just from a purely tactical point of view. And then you had to be out in the open to just have any chance of seeing mo the, the many, many raptors. A short-tailed hawk, which I had in our property just a few days ago. That's a, that's a very low density raptor in, in South America, just as it is here in Florida. The black collared hawk is relatively easy to see along the edges of the lake. Ornate hawk eagles call and actually have loud flight calls as well as the black hawk eagle. The uh, uh, slate colored hawk um, also is another bird that you can, you're more likely to see soaring in the mid morning. So again, from a tactical point of view, we would try to be out in the open as much as we can and scan the skies regularly. With, with, with Ted's ears, it was really quite, uh, quite, quite simple. Then once, once the, the morning was done, then we would simply go looking for mixed species flocks. A very large percentage, probably more than, probably about a third of the birds in these forests live in these permanent mixed species flocks, including ones in the understory led by the bluish slate antshrike, uh, which provides uh, alarm calls to the approach of predators and, and catch, catches a lot of prey. The birds such as the white-eyed antra and flush, the rufous-tailed foliage gleaner also occurs in these flocks. They poke in dead leaves. So these birds, all the, both of these birds poke in dead leaves. They can do risky foraging behavior because the bluish antshrike, the bluish slate antshrike is looking over its shoulder and warning them at the approach of predators and stealing prey. So they, they sometimes even give false alarm calls. They, they cry wolf when, when one of these birds catches a really big prey item. But, but of course they don't do this that often and, uh, and the costs of ignoring the warning could be much more serious than losing. A single prey. So these are fascinating flocks. Uh, we've been studying these in my lab now for many years. Uh, Ari Martinez, who many of you may know, finished his thesis on them. Then in the canopy, the, 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 uh, the understory flocks are, there are a lot of them and they're pretty predictable. The canopy flocks are much more diverse. The, the understory flocks have eight to 10 species typically. The canopy flocks can have as many as 30 or 40 species, mostly organized around the white shouldered, the white winged shrike tanager which does the same thing that the bluish slate entry does for birds such as the paradise tanager, the lemon-throated barbet, and a great many other uh, ant wrens and uh, flycatchers, many, many, many flycatchers. Uh, flycatchers aren't too colorful, so I probably have fewer photos of them than I probably should. Uh, then in, in between looking for flocks, you look for, you try to find ant swarms. Most ant followers are pretty noisy. You can get them without finding the ant swarm, but if you want to have any chance at all, of the um, rufous vented ground cuckoo, Neomorphus jeffreyi, this really, really sought after bird, you'd have to find a, an ant swarm of some kind. But the, you know, the hairy crested ant bird and the black spotted bear eye, these are two very common ant, ant, ant followers. And ant followers in this area have been extremely well studied by Sue Wilson. The woodpeckers are sometimes surprisingly difficult, but they do have loud calls. The, the wonderfully named redneck woodpecker is only about one pair per hundred hectares, but they are so noisy you can miss them. The cream colored woodpecker, a termite specialist, that also eats a lot of fruit and nectar. And the ringed woodpecker, which is huge territory, only calls a couple of times. This is one of those ones you, your best chance by far is during the dawn course. Um, and then the, the ones that you really have to hope for are the forest birds that just don't call much. The striolated puffbird is a reasonably common, no, is this a Rufus, no, Rufus collared puffbird is a reasonably common bird, but they almost never call it. It's inaudible more than 20 meters away, as far as I can tell. And it, it, you just have to hope you, you flush one. The, the Buco capensis, the, God, I forget what the English name is of this. And this is another puffbird um, that is, uh, this is just, does someone here, can someone tell me what the English name of the Buco capensis? Anyway, it's another puffbird that, as far as I can tell, almost never calls. It's very rare. And, uh, and you have to uh, hope you see it. The yellow-throated woodpecker, again, another of these birds that occasionally lets out a shrieking call, but mostly is pretty quiet. These are the birds you just have to hope for. They're, they're there, they're on the plot 
all the time, but the odds of running into them in any one day are fairly low. There are lots of hummingbirds. Again, the hummingbirds, it's hard to plan your day around them. They're all over the place. There are many species of hermits. This is actually a little hermit, a reddish hermit here. There's the Gould's jewel front here. Uh, there's the black throated mangle on the edge of the river. But that, it's just a matter of uh, just being alert to seeing hummingbirds. And you, get, we, you could get as many as 20 species of hummingbirds in a day there if you were very lucky. And then when you get out to the, but, you know, these river edge habitats really are um, uh, you know, very, very important for almost all of these birds. You know, this, this particular, this, working in this scrubby habitat is also where you look for vagrants. There are lots and lots of rare birds that seem to use these rivers as dispersal corridors when they're wandering around globally. So th 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 this would be very much like uh, you know, going out to Point Pelee or, or, uh, or one of these other places where the vagrants, or Fort DeSoto, where the vagrants really pack in. So bird watchers as, you know, stay out there as long as they can stand it, but the heat by mid-morning, the heat is almost unbearable. And then they're just all these birds here, which are just the kind of basic birds that, that people like Ted Parker figured out how to identify. The, the, the elegant wood creeper, strangely named, there are 15 or 16 species of wood creepers, all look about the same. There's a, there, are, there are spine tails. There, this is a striped wood hunter, these foliage gleaners, many, many of them that fit in various ways. There are leaf tossers that, as the name suggests, toss the leaves off the ground. There are, there are relatively few ant pitters in the lowlands. If you're, if you're an eco-tourist, you go to highland, high Andes, ant pitters are really what you're looking for. And then there are tapaculos, again, mainly a highland lineage, but there are, there's at least one lowland bird. The, okay, this is the Amazonian ant pitter, and this is the rusty belted tapaculo. And then you get even more, more just basic birds that you have to hope you can see. This is a bird we all know and love well now, the tropical kingbird, which, which spent a few days at Marjorie Kinn Rawling State Park recently. This bird is so common, it's almost a joke, but I, I nevertheless went out to the state park to see it a few days ago. There are adelas, bright rumped adela here, bicards, spectacular treetop katingas like the spango katinga, and this bare neck fruit crow, which flies overhead. There are Many different mannequins you can see, very common birds. You hear them constantly, but they're quite, quite challenging to see. Mastering all these birds was something that we were just beginning to learn how to do. Um, and when the field guides finally did come out, they just, they, they, you know, this is, I think, Birds of Columbia. This, this just became our Bible. This was the, here was a chance to really get the details on some of these plumages by, by no less than Guy Tudor, one of the great artists of the great bird artists of all time. Then we really, you know, th this, this took us up to a whole new level. Um, I should point out that, that what we, we had broken the record by 11 in the morning, the world record, which back then was only about 275. And we, uh, we had hit 300 by, I think, noon. And we didn't really have much of a plan for the afternoon because we had achieved all of our goals rather quickly. So we just kind of wandered around aimlessly and, Add another 30. But if we had plotted things a little better, we probably could have uh, uh, done quite a bit. But the real, one really sad thing was that the next day, Ted went out and, on, to census part of the plot and he heard a bird he'd never heard before. And he recorded it. And it turned out to be this bird here, the rufous fronted ant thrush. And this was a bird that was known from a couple of skins collected by some of the, some of the, uh, the, the native collectors who worked with Frank Chapman. And it was essentially unknown. Uh, uh, and, and Ted heard the song, and being Ted, he immediately recognized that this has to be the Rufus Fred Anthrax. And sure enough, there it was. We, we, the, this species was rediscovered, to, at least to scientists, um, the, the, the following day. We thought about redoing the big day two days later, just, just so we could add, just so we could add a, a newly rediscovered bird to the, to the list. But, but uh, this, this turns out to be a, not a common bird by any means, but it turns out to be a fairly widespread bird now that, now that Ted figured out what the song was. So let's see, I've got some chats up here. Let me see if someone supplied the name of it. Collared puffer, thank you. Yeah, the, the, the mystery puffer was a collared puffer. Uh, this is the worst slide you will ever see, I hope. <laughs> this is our list. Uh, it was 331. We could have easily, if we had had a Terra Fermi trail system or had any bamboo available, we could have easily added another 30, 40 species. Uh, Andy Crowder did his thesis on bamboo birds in a field station just about uh, 
100 miles from probably less than 100 miles from Punta Cashew. Um, and, uh, you know, the, so this was, this was quite frustrating that we just, the bamboo had died off a few years earlier. I should point out that recently a bunch of us went back to Cocha Cashew to redo that census that, that we had done back in 1982. I'm not quite the 40th anniversary of the census. There's been a lot of concern recently about declining birds in the middle of the Amazon basin. This is one of the really uh, scary prospects out there because uh, Betty Loisel and John Blake here at UF um, and uh, the, the, the group working out of Manaus in Brazil uh, and other, it's now increasingly more and more groups are finding that the birds in the middle of the Amazon where they sense us have been declining over the last 15 or 20 years. We had the, we had the first of these 100 hectare plots and we decided to get John Turborg here. This is Ros uh, Rosanna Arcanio, uh, John Fitzpatrick and, uh, and me. We, we went back and redid this census with a whole new team of people led by Ari Martinez and and, and mostly Peruvian crew, including Tomas Valki, another one of the great, great birders of, of, of his era, um, and redid this entire census to see if the birds had crashed there. And I'm happy to say that at least in this one place, the bird populations appear to be hold, hanging on pretty well. The forest hasn't changed, but you know, there's been a lot of severe weather events, but at least in this one area, there, there, do, there does not appear to be this widespread pattern of population declines, although the manuscript, the analysis of these data is ongoing. As you can imagine, the statistics on this. So this is, so the, this at least has offers some hope that these immense national parks, such as the Manu National Park, where we did this record, has, was an area of almost 2 million acres, um, and, or hectares, sorry, about the size of Connecticut. And these giant national parks, which is the basic conservation unit now in Amazonia, Brazil and Ecuador, Peru, uh, Colombia, these huge parks do have some capacity to maybe buffer some of these birds against, against these, these impacts of, at least we hope, of climate change as well. So with that, I will stop and uh, be happy to take questions. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, make, make it so everyone can all right, y'all, uh, I've uh, set it to where y'all can unmute yourselves. If anyone has questions, y'all can send them, uh, ask, ask, ask Scott. So uh, is this national park called uh, the Manu National Park, M-A-N-U? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, M-A-N-U, yes. It's, there are a number of tourist lodges around the edge of it, and the Manu Road has many tourist lodges, and it's also a place you can go you can go there on high budget or, or, or no budget. It's a wonderful place. You can, uh, you can walk the whole length of the road and then getting into the, you, you do have to take boat trips or you can take local transportation. It's, it's very accessible up till the beginning of the Manu River, but the actual Manu National Park, M-A-N-U, is the deeper part is still pretty inaccessible. It's still a highly protected reserve, partly because some of these uh, indigenous tribes are, uh, still a little hostile to uh, uh, Westerners. I mean, they do, uh, they, they, all, they always tolerated us. We, we, we never knew why, perhaps because we never, we never killed anything, but they, all, they, they let us alone. But, but if you went much upriver from where we were, uh, you were, you were definitely taking your life into your hands. I mean, we, we, we knew we were being watched, but, uh, but, we, but they didn't seem to, uh, I don't know, they, 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 never, they never bothered us one way or the other. Do you know what Manu means? Does it mean something in the local language? I, I don't think so. No, I think it's just a name. It, uh, okay. I should know the answer to that. If Again, if someone listening in knows the answer to that, please. It's my know. daughter's name, you know, and I'm wondering oh, if really? I have that name in South America. So oh, yeah. Have Manu. <laughs> yeah, that, well, yeah, there's a basketball player with, a name, with that name, too. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's, it's a, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great name. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and it's it's really uh, you know, it, it was the original mega national park, uh, and that was the Peruvian government had a visionary set of conservationists way back in the late seventies who set up these gigantic ecosystem level uh, national parks. Uh, Antonio Brock Egg, I think, was a major major player in this, and they you know that we you know, we had nothing to do with this particular uh, setting up this park. We we simply took advantage of this. 
this is an entire watershed of the Manu River. This is an ecosystem level conservation plan. So it's really a, an amazing thing that you know, there are lots of these. You know, this has become a model for parks nationwide. The conservation situation in South America is in fantastic shape. There are giant national parks all over the place. I'm not saying there aren't issues. I mean, but you know, I know they're playing a damning lot of these rivers, but but it is really uh, remarkable how many of these giant reserves there are. And if you look at your Google Maps of the Peruvian Amazon, the, the thing you don't realize is that when we started out this work, but from the edge of the Andes, you could look 2,000 miles in one direction over unbroken forest, or maybe it's 2,000 kilometers, an enormous distance, unbroken forest, I mean, you know, no roads whatsoever. That's not 100% true now, but that area is still mostly forest. So the Department of Madre de Dios in Peru is, I think, at last, it was 94% of it was covered with primary lowland forest. So this part of the world still has gigantic areas of undisturbed forest. Again, where, where these tribes can wander around without you know, avoiding us, you know, deliberately not contacting us. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, the, when they can do this without being disturbed. It's, a, it's, it's an amazing thing. And how many days uh, did it, does it take you to reach this place? Like if you fi fly, from say Miami, where do you fly to, and how well, much time does it take to reach? Well, actually, you can. Yeah, you, it, it, it's it, the, now that there are tourist lodges, it's a lot easier. Like the, 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 in the old days, it, it took about twelve days, twelve to fourteen days to get in there. If you included all the time you spent getting your permits and buying groceries, and uh, and the actual trip in typically took about five days, two days in truck, three days in a boat. But now they have high powered. Uh, outboard motors that actually are outboard outboard motors, and they have uh, uh, vans that take you quickly. They have uh, they have domes over your boat, so you're you're shaded, which you don't see as many birds that way because you, you miss some things flying over. But boy, it's a lot more comfortable. Uh, and you can fly to Cusco. You you could probably be uh, at the edge of the Manu River in one day out of Cusco. And Cusco is one of the most amazing cities on earth. Uh, and you know, it's just you, know, you you can spend a lot of time in Cusco and really enjoy it. You know, it's just the archaeological sites there are fantastic. There's some great burning sites here by then you can then you can go up over, over and go down the Manu Road and stop at tourist lodges and you know that whole thousand species plus transect. Um, it's, you know, it's hard burning. I mean, don't get me wrong. Even with field guides, it's hard burning, but it's it's doable. And then you can stay in, you know, again, lodges from anywhere from camping all the way up to really comfortable uh, high-end lodges. It's, it's, you can you can pick any any way you want to do it. I really recommend you do it. It's a thank you very much for answering all my questions. You're welcome. Uh, Scott, someone had asked earlier, like what time of uh, you, you said this was in the summer, right? I was in September. Yeah, we did the big record in September. We were trying to get the North American migrants coming down before the South, you know, the Southern migrants left, and that worked pretty well. Nice. September is also the very end of the dry season, beginning of the rainy season when everybody's breeding. So they're all, well, not everybody, most birds are breeding and singing. Hummingbirds and ground nesters breed during the dry season, but uh, but but so the, the song activity was quite good then. That, that was when we did all our censusing too. Um, what, of those 331, um, how many of them were like actually like uh, vagrants? I mean, it sounded like, you had an, it sounded like a, the vast majority of them were you know, residents or, you know, like ex yeah. expected, I guess, for that area. Yeah, it was actually the, the people look at that list, look at it, and they yawn, and they say, these are all the common things. Uh, we didn't actually do too well on the vagrants. Um, we, uh, of course, back then, we didn't know they were common. <laughs> we, you know, we, there were no data, you know. Um, so I, I should point out that 90, 99 or 98 of these species, we only heard. So you, you, there's no way on earth you're going to see more than 250 species in a day, even if you tape them all in, because um, that takes too much time. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we had almost no vagrants. If again, if we did it over again, we we would spend a lot of time out on the edge of the river and really, really pack in the vagrants. But, but again, it's a tricky thing because there's so many residents, you don't really need vagrants. But the vagrants are more fun. So it's it's just uh, yeah. I don't think I don't actually think we had one bird on that big day that was even mildly unusual. Really? Wow, that's that's incredible. Yeah, when I when I eBird, when I put entered the big day into eBird, everyone everyone was like, "Oh, we thought you had seen cool birds that day." <laughs> oh no! Now, now, I, now again, you're the, with with all the information you have now, and you know, with a few months of practice, you could you, you could probably do this. Uh, 
you know, and, and it, it's really fun. I mean, it's just that's amazing. All right, who else has questions? Let's see. Let me make sure I got everything. Yeah. I got a question. Sure. Dr. Robinson, this is Andres. Hi, guys. Hi, Andres. Good. Uh, a quick question. I mean, also, you went to the clay leaks. Um, how, you know, this kind of habit does it will increase your chances to see more observations? I know that you were looking for the, you know, everywhere, but, uh, you know, the rivers. But I don't, I, don't, I don't know what you think about, you know, getting into those um, kind of, you know, more clothes and, uh, you know, those cavities, cavities of caves where you can probably get some, I don't know, uh, some of the parrots and variety. I, I don't know, in, in Peru, probably that's the, the area where you see all this huge extension of, uh, of uh, clay leak with the uh, macaws and mm -hmm. all that. Yeah, we, we did, uh, I don't think there are too many caves in this particular area. I don't think the soil supports them very well. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that, that would be a possibility. Getting up into the, the up into the terra firma, the upland uh, habitat would would be huge increase. I should point out that Andres is Ecuadorian, and the Ecuadorians now have the world record. They 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 broke this record, I think, by a substantial amount, uh, two or three years ago, I think. So, but but before that, though, there, there, it was the world record for about 37, 38 years, um, <laughs> and, it, and it was entirely on foot and by dugout canoe in one square mile. So it was it was definitely the lowest tech big day of all time. Although there there is a birder named Alex Weeby who is apparently the the, the ace of all aces coming out of Cornell, who, who broke the record all by himself. Of course, you, you have to have a team legally to, uh, to have a big day, but, but uh, he, just, he, did, he did his whole, his entire record on foot. He didn't even use a, a boat. So he has, he has one, one step up on us. So, um, so it, it's definitely, the, the record sitting there, it, the, uh, 400 species day by foot is possible if you, if you increase it to one and a half square miles. Um, and uh, it's just, you just have to have the right conditions. The, the, the Kocha Cashew area has a very high density of these birds. They're all right next to each other. In some of the other habitats, there's there are bigger patch of the habitat, but it's, you can't move between them very easily, so you miss a bunch of them. That's all I can think of, because that record lasted for a really long time. I tried to break it 10 times, and the Ted, the Ted Parker effect was, I, I could, without Ted, you know, Fitz and I and Turborg and I, we, we couldn't uh, we couldn't get that uh, additional eight or nine species. We got three twenty six months. We were we were close. Uh, what kind of advice do you have for uh, folks? I mean, uh, try, uh, interested in learning, you know, bird songs and vocalizations, like how to, you know, so much of this, uh, so much of this effort, like hinged um, on you know identifying birds by sound. Uh, what? How did how did you approach learning that? Well, in, in my case, I was, you know, I, I learned a lot of songs just through my own observation, but I was really lucky. I went out, I followed John Turborg. I, I, I did, I only overlap with, with Fitz a little bit, but, you know, he just had him teach me directly, just like my dad taught me bird song. So I never had to learn a Blackburnian song. Uh, he pointed it out. And, uh, and, so, and then, um, but right now it's, you can just listen to eBird. In fact, there are tapes. You can buy CDs if, if you remember that ancient technology that has most of the lowland birds of Amazonia. And you can just, I just plop them in my car when I'm going to go down there in census and just do a refresher and just as you one after another. It's, I mean, they're, they're, these, these things are available easily now. I'm sure you can get them online. You can probably download the low, lowland birds of Amazonia in Peru. And there's probably a, Cornell probably has a collection and just, just memorize them one after. But most of the songs are pretty distinctive. There, there are some that are subtle or there's some I could never, you know, there are two tyrannulas that I simply can't, my ears don't tell me that those are different songs. Everyone else can get them, but I can't. So it's just a, a strange thing. And so, but, but the advice is, yeah, just learn the, learn the songs ahead of time uh, so you can get the basics down and then just, just enjoy learning them firsthand once you're down there. Excellent, thank you, yeah. That's... 
someone. Uh, okay. here, here's a comment here. Uh, Ari Martinez working on a method to learn vast amounts of songs. Oh, that, okay. Oh, oh, that, oh, this is Jose Miguel. Yes, Jose Miguel Ponciano is a, who's the, you know, the, uh, the uh, a rising star of birding in Hachua now. He, he was down there with us. I don't have a picture of you, Jose Miguel. I don't know how that happened. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, he, he was down there uh, participating in the re-census and doing all the statistical analysis. So, uh, yeah, but again, please, you, you really should go there. It's just, you know, it's a great place to spend a few months if you, or a few weeks, or even a, even a week. <laughs> all right, it's beautiful. Should. Well, um, unless we have any further questions, uh, you know, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, that was <laughs> that. That's incredible. Uh, it's that's that's it's it's been amazing to listen to to what this experience was like, and you know, I'll, especially in you know in the context and like in the how how long it, the the record endured. Just that's that's incredible. But thank you so much for your time and for sharing with us. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us with the technical difficulties at the beginning. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, uh, any, any, anything to add? Anyone? Awesome. Thank you all so much. We'll get this uh, recording uploaded uh, to, I'll try to get this uh, uploaded to YouTube and uh, um, posted on our website along with some of our other uh, evening, pro uh, most recent evening programs. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing y'all uh, next time, um, again, check our uh, 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 um, website, elijahwadabond.org, uh, our events listings. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff on the schedule and a lot of great field trips coming up throughout this, you know, spring migration coming up. And if anyone has any questions about anything, always feel free to reach out to us. Um, again, and again, thank you, Scott. That was incredible. It's always a real, it's, it's a real pleasure learning from you every time, you know, from you know, even just moments, uh, uh, I remember the field trip you led out to Cones Dyke, just constantly learning new stuff. It's amazing. It's, you know, there are very, there's a handful of folks uh, you, that you just hear them talk around here and you just, the amount of knowledge you can soak up just from being there and like listening, like you and Andy Crider and Adam and Gina Kent and, you know, Rex Rowan and so many other folks, um, you know, both, you know, here in Alachua County and Marion and beyond. So. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. You're welcome. All right, y'all. Have a great evening. See y'all next time. See you. Thank you, Tim.